Prisoners of war move along Tallinn streets flanked by troops of the Estonian Rifle Corps. These are Germans, descendants of the people who tried to suppress the Estonian people for seven centuries. Now they are reminded of the lesson they were given in 1944. The flag of freedom flies above the fortifications of Tompea. On November 24, 1944, the last remaining corner of Estonia, the Surve Peninsula, was occupied by the Soviets. Soviet people, mainly soldiers from neighboring Russia, were brought in to implement and consolidate Soviet power to build a new sort of societal order. For those who hadn't left Estonia, the most frightening thing now was uncertainty. What would happen next? Would there be another deportation? Would more people be killed? For many, the only consolation they could find was to wait for the legendary white ship, a phrase meaning rescue by the democratic Western powers. The war was over. Still insidious, the Red Regime seemed to have become milder. Parts of the Estonian national anthem remained in use. Christmas Day remained a holiday under a different name. But a week before Christmas, mass terror returned with Decree No. 380 applying to those who had collaborated with the Germans. During the next five years, 12,000 people were arrested. I was at a meeting in Tallinn. It was disgusting and painful to see how a young man was arrested behind my back. He was taken away because he did not take off his hat when they played the Internationale. Some of the Russians were on our side. In the beginning, we went to a Russian family near Palmse. They gave us shelter. They didn't like communism. The Russian nationality wasn't bad, but the government was. The tension of the times is not apparent in these peaceful scenes. People didn't want to go along with the new order, but one has to live and work. The new rulers began seeking their enemies. Power was in the hands of the party. 500 occupation troops were dispatched to every county. Informers, snitches and agents were recruited using extreme pressure. I wouldn't say that their attitude was directly hostile, apart from those officers with golden epaulets who belonged to the security police and beat me all day so that my bottom was in shreds. But these, of course, weren't what you would call real officers. This wasn't what one would normally call an army. They were murderers and butchers. These are two totally different things. They kept harassing my mother, a gentleman, so to speak, visited her during the daytime when father was working and I was at school. He asked mother, what do they speak about, this person or that person? Propaganda blamed the Germans for the destruction of cities that had actually been carried out by the Soviet armed forces. The ruins were leveled and old, valuable buildings were destroyed. The city of Narva ceased to exist. Pernu, Tallinn and Tartu were partially destroyed. Many monuments were destroyed in order to make people forget their history. Rebuilding the hometown that endured suffering during the war has become a labor of honor for all citizens. Our builders can proudly report that the reconstruction of the Estonia Opera House was successfully finished in time for the 30th anniversary of the great October Socialist Revolution. The greatest cultural building of Soviet Estonia has been finished and is more beautiful than ever. This architectural and artistic transformation is a great achievement made possible by the work of the Soviet people. It took three years to rebuild the Estonia Opera House. Reconstruction of this important building was part of a plan that emphasized conciliation, but only in the beginning. The Stalinist interior design, especially the painted ceiling, was a song of praise to the happiness brought by the rays of Stalin's sun. Immediately after the Russians arrived, they began to arrest those who had served in the German army. When friends, neighbors and relatives were arrested, those who hadn't been caught yet had no alternative but to take to the forests. 
The ranks of the guerrilla movement included a lot of men who had fought in the German or Finnish armed forces. The father and mother were killed and one son escaped. He had been shot in the leg but he managed to get home and hide, but they knew that he was there. I was teaching a German lesson and saw how they brought them. The fathers of the boys, they were from Wuhman Palmse. They were flanked by soldiers. Russians had come into Pruna village and were stealing. A neighbor went to stop them, but they killed him with an axe handle. Industrialization began. Enterprises in Estonia, both new and reconstructed, rarely made sense in terms of being economically viable. The labor force was brought into Estonia. One of the goals was to Russify the population. The number of industrial workers tripled in six years. The eastern part of Viruma was almost completely Russified. In the towns as well, especially in Tallinn, an influx of foreign workers began. Industrial production was down by more than half in comparison to 1941. Reconstruction of industry meant that Estonia was integrated into the Soviet all-union system with an emphasis on heavy industry. A new oil shale gas industry was created to supply Leningrad. Expansion of the oil shale industry brought with it extremely rapid industrial growth, 36% a year. Overexploited Estonian farms had to feed cities and industries. Rationing was the order of the day. Long lines were everywhere. People took their places at night. The notorious sugar lines were half a kilometer long. People went there in the middle of the night, and the next day they got their half a kilo of sugar, one month's worth. Those who didn't have food cards took shelter in the woods. According to various estimates, there were 15 to 30,000 men in the forests after the war from all walks of life. Some fought, weapon in hand, while others simply hid. There were more freedom fighters in Vuruma and Pernuma than anywhere else. The most active period of the guerrilla war lasted up until the mass deportations of 1949. Estonian partisans didn't accomplish that much militarily, but morally their struggle was of great importance. We took a car. The sexton's son, Edward, dressed as a militiaman, and I played the role of a traffic controller. A car came from Pernu. We stopped it with a red flag. I told the driver, get out of the car. We went to the Russian and said, hands up, we are Estonian guerrillas. A car came from Narva. When it stopped, we were given a sign. We opened fire at once. There was a driver, a staff officer, and a third man. They were all killed. We pushed the car aside and set it on fire. They attacked military convoys and officers of the secret police, often executive committees too, which on the local level were the main instruments of the Soviet occupation. We decided with Jakub, who had served in the Estonian Corps, that we ought to go to the communal building. We wrapped our feet in rags and potato bags so as to not make any noise. Our hall included automatic weapons, Estonian military rifles, and magazines for the semi-automatic weapons, which were very hard to get. We also took some food. Then we left. They just slept and were unaware of what had happened.
It was with gladness and enthusiasm that Estonian cities and villages celebrated the fifth anniversary of Soviet Estonia. Comrade Weimer, chairman of the Council of the People's Commissars of the Estonian SSR, opens the big joyful town meeting. The newsreel only shows one side of this life with two faces, the luck of getting to live under Stalin's son. The interrogator took his gun, slammed it on the table, and said, I'll kill him like a whelp if he keeps mocking us with his false names. Father came home. I was there alone. He said to me, I'm not going back. He joined the liberation movement. It was difficult to try to hold out in the woods and in the underground movement, and it was easy to be caught. The files of interrogations contain statements that were largely induced by what is politely called physical intervention. It is difficult to tell which ones contain true accounts and which were signed in utter despair. He testified in Patare prison and told me that he denounced me. He said he just couldn't bear it anymore. They beat him with clubs. We were in adjoining cells. I asked who he was and he told me his name and that he denounced us. He said he had a wife and they beat him with clubs. I said, I and my friends have wives too. The widespread principle among the resistance fighters was not to be taken alive because they didn't know how they would succeed in enduring interrogation. If they were caught alive, the rule number one was to keep one silence for three days. After that, you were allowed to talk. If a man went missing and he didn't show up in three days, you had to leave your bunker and relocate to a new place. In addition to the guerrilla, schoolboys also resisted the Soviet regime. Their idea was to do something to show that not everyone accepted the new Soviet system. Eighty-two trials were held during the period from 1945 until 53. Over 700 school children were given guilty verdicts. Student resistance groups destroyed communist monuments in Tallinn, Tartu and Rakvere. Leaflets were also distributed. I worked in a printing plant. There I composed a text, brought it home with some printer's ink and a rubber roll, and with my friend we made these leaflets. One organization based in Thailand killed the guard while gathering supplies and weapons. A group of boys in Tartu wanted to go to Finland, but they were discovered. They shot one militiaman fatally and wounded the other. The Soviet system prosecuted all of these things as terrorism. In this case, six death penalties were pronounced and three were carried out. The repressive structure was complex in nature. There were the courts and various tribunals, and also extrajudicial mechanisms such as troikas and special councils. Ordinarily, interrogation was carried out only at night, but during the day you weren't supposed to sleep. This went on night after night. The interrogators would differ. You sit on a bench or sometimes you'd stand. Eventually, you're ready to sign anything just to make it stop. They beat everyone just out of principle, so to speak. They wanted to find out who had served in the Finnish army and resided in Tartu, but there were quite a few of us. They were also interested in student underground organizations. Acquiring knowledge of progressive Soviet science, a new generation of scientific workers is born. Its supreme goal is to serve the working people with all of their capability and abilities. Studies at Tartu University began in November 1944. The party demanded that Marxist-Leninist theory pervade studies and scientific research. Students and lecturers were subjected to pressure. During five years, the university party organization grew from three members to 109.
Scientific societies were shut down, among them the Learned Estonian Society in 1950. The publications of the university ceased to appear. The main task now was to re-evaluate the country's cultural heritage. Censorship was employed. 26 million forbidden books were gathered and destroyed, often by burning. 15% of the valuable holdings of libraries survived in special holding areas, but these too were often mutilated, with forbidden pages being cut out or brushed with ink. During the decade of 1940 to 1950, over 6,000 new books and booklets were published, totaling more than 40 million copies. This amounts to nearly five books per person a year. Every fifth book had a social political emphasis, such as books by Lenin and Stalin. <laughs> When I returned from prison after a year, things had changed. People were much more afraid. But the mental attitude of lecturers had remained the same. This lasted until 1949, perhaps 1950. Then Soviet pressure grew, and the lecturers too began to fear. Many of them were arrested. Hundreds of peasants and workers joined hands to make fallow lands bear fruit. Together, Estonians repair the deep wounds of war, fulfill and overfulfill the targets of the new five year plan. They achieve cultural and economic prosperity for the homeland. After they have labored at the People's Meeting, Secretary of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Bolshevist Party, Comrade Karotam, lent his approval to the proficiency and single-mindedness of the inhabitants of Sarema for having increased the fertility of their farmlands. Their patriotic initiative will be lauded as an example to others in all of Soviet Estonia. They made this list of kulaks and began to repress them. In the beginning they were forced to harvest huge quantities of lumber, but here in Haryuma we didn't have any forests close by. So they had to go somewhere, all the way up to Alutakuse. They took their meals and went. The women weren't allowed to accompany them. They had no choice but to hire assistants who became burdensome to them because of the labor expenses that this brought with it. What's more, they had to hand over huge specified amounts of agricultural products to the state. These were many times bigger than the norms of smaller peasants. And finally, they were hit with large monetary payments these were in the thousands of rubles, but rubles were hard to get. It was a foregone conclusion. They were pronounced to be kulaks who hadn't fulfilled their obligations to the state. They were afraid of people and that they might be able to cope and do well. In collective farms, they hauled up cows to the ceiling with ropes. It was all a big farce. At the same time, they sang and claimed that we had the best life and the fairest system in the world. But then they sucker-punched you, and the deportations began. What the Soviet system did to the Estonian people is documented on shelves with a total length of one and a half kilometers at the Estonian National Archive. Among these files are materials from the security police and the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The materials that pertain to the deportations are also to be found here. This had many thought-out objectives. One of them was to destroy the farms of Estonia, because that was where the Estonian salt of the earth came from. Obviously, if left untouched, the Russians wouldn't have been able to sow the seeds of their mentality here. Besides, the farms provided for and helped those who were in the woods.
The main task for Soviet Estonian peasants now is to gather the rich harvest on time and without losses. Threshing machines are performing their task in all villages so that the threshing can be quickly completed and the debt of honor to the state can be paid. Peasants from the No rural district in Tartuma went so far as to organize what they call a red transport of grain in order to fulfill their promise to comrade Stalin to quickly attain their target norm of grain production. Party propaganda didn't initially reveal its plan for collectivization. The signal from Moscow came in May 1947. Massive collectivization was carried out in spring of 1949 in all of the western parts of the Soviet Union, but it was preceded by another huge wave of deportations. Estonian resistance fighters thought that they wouldn't be affected. Actually, after the deportations, many more people took refuge in the woods, joined guerrilla groups, and started to exact revenge for the deportations. I remember a chairman of a kolhos who came to our meeting barefooted. His trousers were rolled up. He was bearing an automatic weapon. He came to talk with us. At five in the morning they banged on our door with their rifle butts and a big group of men entered. They bore nothing to indicate their rank which was characteristic of the NKVD. They wore soldiers' great coats and sharp pointed hats. They were leaders. There was an Estonian woman with them, one I didn't know. She read the decree to my grandmother, informing her that she had been sentenced to exile. The neighbor woman came, crying and asking if we had any bread. Their family was being taken away. Could we give them some bread to take on the journey? We gave her bread and thought, what will happen next? We were afraid, but they didn't come after us. On that day, all the phones were out of order. We didn't understand why, but then we saw those cars, with all the deported people in them. The most depressing thing was that they read to you that you were receiving a life sentence, that if you tried to escape you would get 25 years at hard labor, that you had no right to choose jobs or a profession. The only thing that awaited you was hard physical work. This is repression of the worst kind. Before the mass deportations, 8% of Estonian farms were collectivized. In a month's time, that figure had leapt up to 64%. State norms and tractor stations swallowed up most of the crops that the newly established collective farms were capable of producing. Work in kolhoses lost its meaning, and the kolhosniks lost their work habits. A huge campaign of joining the collective farms began. Everybody applied because they were afraid of being deported. I remember when I came home from Sakati, I met my mother, and she had our cow on a line with her. There's a dairy farm nearby. I asked, why are you taking our cow there? And she answered, my grandfather, her father, Daniel Rom, had said that we must always do as the state orders. According to the research I've done, the lowest salary paid in a kolhoz was four kopecks and 90 grams of straw a day. That amounts to a yearly salary of 12 rubles and 90 kilos of straw. In one article I wrote that the kolhoznik's salary was just big enough that he could order the district newspaper Harjuelu and read about how well the kolhoznik's were living.
Yes, the campaigns and slogans. An example. They demanded from us, school teachers, that there have to be slogans in schools and other places, even in barns. Teachers were on all fours on the floor of the hall drawing slogans. It was so hard to believe all of what had happened. I loved Estonia so much. When my father listened to the voice of America, my mother was so afraid that someone might find out. And then... We had a big Estonian flag. Lots of searches were being carried out, so we cut the flag into three parts. The white segment was in one place, the blue was used as a tablecloth, and the black was in a third place. The small flag for display on the table was also hidden, but on Independence Day we would take it out. We were very disappointed in the West. We listened to the radio stations and waited for the white ship to come. We truly believed in it. The neighbor boys had a little radio and we listened, hoping that the white ship will come. What came instead were the deportations. No one came. It felt like betrayal. Hope was lost. See on nagu mingi reetmine just kui ja sellest peale sellest peale kadus nagu loobus. Comrades, let's lift a toast to the best friend of the Estonian people. He who provided the Estonian peasants with the chance to join the kolhoses and therefore to develop culturally. To comrade Stalin's health. Many things changed during the five post-war years. Soviet power had arrested tens of thousands of people. In 1945 there were but 2,400 members in the Communist Party. A year later there were over 7,000. In 1950, repression of the so-called bourgeois nationalists was introduced in cultural life, and the white ship was nowhere to be seen.